Okay, we're going to talk, <clears throat> we're starting on uh, our restarting. This is a restart because it was so, we only got a chance to do one or two before Christmas. So, okay. So this is, <clears throat> what is your purpose in life? This, Bethany asked that question. Matter of fact, a lot of our Bible studies come from questions Bethany asked. Bethany says, Dad, why is it when I ask questions you make a Bible study out of it? Mm -hmm. I said, because you won't listen. i got to make it good long. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. She does. She asks some very great questions. I'm impressed with the questions that she always asks. Absolutely. Asked. She does a great job with that. Well, this one's a good one. Yes, I'm, I'm, this is a redo. So, so y'all that were here the very first time, you're gonna, some of y'all going to understand this, and some of you, it'll be good because maybe the first time you didn't quite get it. <clears throat> well, what is your purpose in life? Now, of course, last time we started <laughs> with actually what was your purpose in life. Remember, that's what you're talking about. We started out with a, with a, a preamble. Okay. We're not starting out with a preamble this time. The preamble will come along the, the way. But uh, I'm going to talk, talk about two people, and I'm going to talk about them along the way a whole lot. So, uh, I want you to, let's pray first. Father, I love you and I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for the hope that you give us, Lord, every day to our life. Lord, we're not left out here on some uh, uncharted island. We're not in some kind of lifeboat with nobody around us. We've always got you with us, Lord. We're never alone. No matter how it looks on the outside, we're never alone. You're always with us. I ask you right now, Lord, to bless us and anoint us and help us, God, to keep you at the forefront, knowing, God, that you've got this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said? Amen. 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 All right. All right. Consider your purpose for life. That's probably one of the biggest things I get asked uh, along the way is how do I know my purpose in life? How can I discover what God has called me to do? Now, when God's calling you now, here's what you got to remember. His calling has many facets in your life. You have a, you have a personal calling. You have a personal calling at work. You have a personal calling at church. You have a personal calling in your family. You like, like Maybe your calling is to be a good wife or a good husband, to be a father, or maybe not to be a father or a mother or not a mother. Maybe your calling is uh, to be uh, a pastor, an evangelist, a helper in the church, whatever it is. So there's so many different... The purpose in our, life, in our lives are, are just like this. They're, they're, there's many things. Don't think you just got one thing. You know, remember Curly on... Uh, on city slickers, one thing, just one thing, that's the meaning of life. No, the purpose of life is this. Matter of fact, every last one of us, we can hold our hands up and then think about on my job, with my family, personally, at the church, with some of my co workers, uh, and just going down the line, uh, brothers and sisters, all these purposes that you have in life. So remember, it's not just one thing, it's many things. All right? So. <clears throat> Uh, here we're going to talk about, we're going to start off with this little analogy, and we're going to talk about these two guys all along the way, because we can show you what it's like to, I've heard people say before, I had one lady, she would call me every day, not from here, this is one of the first churches I pastored, she called me just about every day, and just about every day, she was determined that God had told her to do something a certain way, every day. And within, a, within 24 to 48 hours, God had changed his mind. Mm -hmm. And so after about a month of this, she said, I know God's called me to do it because I feel the burning in my heart. <clears throat> and I said, you might want to think about getting some Rolaids because I don't think it's God talking. I think it's indigestion. Because <clears throat> God doesn't change his mind every other day. Okay, we change every day, but God doesn't change every other day. <clears throat> So, here we go. Series two lies. And I wrote this down so you can keep it, look at it. I want you to think about this. And I'm going to read you something in a minute that's going to blow, blow your mind. Absolutely. Uh, uh, just uh, blow you away. And I wish I had the writings of this other guy so I could read both of them. <clears throat> but I just remembered the other guy. There was, <clears throat> consider these two lives. These two powerful men. Both of these men were prominent leaders. Both of these guys were progressive, and they were absolutely change makers. They both changed the history of the world. They both were exceptional orators. When they spoke, things happened. People would just get mesmerized when these guys spoke. When they spoke, people changed their minds, people changed their hearts, and they changed their lives. These guys were such powerful guys, sort of like a Billy Graham sort of guy. 
they were both heralded as heroes. Everybody considered both of them to be heroes. They impacted millions of people. And whatever they set about to do always sent a ripple effect. No matter what they did, if they said something, people did it. And if people did it, it just kept on and on and on. And their ripple effect went all over the world. They both possessed a purpose-driven life. But each one took a different, a distinctly different course, all right? One was the Apostle Paul. He was driven by a divine purpose. And the other was Adolf Hitler. He was driven by a diabolical purpose. <clears throat> Jesus made this, made this right here. He made this, he said, uh, 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 The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the out overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Luke 6, 45. I just want to read you something here. Adolf Hitler set or sought to fulfill his purpose in life first by serving his country. He was a corporal. In World War I, he was a corporal. After the war, he had a strong sense of patriotism and it led him uh, into politics. And he penned this book called Mein Kampf. Y'all heard of Mein Kampf? Okay, <clears throat> or my conf, how you say it, I said it wrong, okay, which means my struggle. And it's a two-volume set dictating his ideology. Now, now in this, he talks about superior race and all this stuff. I mean, it's some, some powerful, powerful stuff. Surrounding himself with a handful of like-minded men, he became leader of the National Socialist German Workers Party, the Nazi Party. He was named Chancellor of Germany in 1933. And he was named Fuhrer in 1934. Emerging as a, dom as a dominant political force, his influence soon became global. And believe it or not, in 1938, he was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Wow. Think about that. So 1938, he's, he's, that just blows me away. Time Magazine's Man of the Year. But Hitler's greatest source of significance did not come from titles, didn't come from him but the top building on the world stage. His sense of self-worth, y'all listen, his sense of self-worth was rooted in what he believed was a divine mandate. He believed God was talking to him. He believed he had a mission given to him by God himself. He considered himself to be called or to be summoned. So this wasn't just something he was just crazily doing. He thought God had called him to distinguish the Jews. Wow. Now, now listen to this. Tell, tell me who wrote this. My Christian feelings point me to my Lord and Savior as a fighter. They point me toward the man who, once lonely and surrounded by only a few followers, recognized these Jews and called for battle against them. And who is the true God was not only the greatest as a sufferer, but also the greatest as a warrior. That was written by Hitler. Huh. Crazy, isn't it? That's why we've got to see these two lives here when we're talking about divine purpose. Hitler distorted Christianity, and his hatred for the Jews revealed him to be a child of the devil. Now, I was writing a, uh, I wrote a 10 page essay on euthanasia. And I used genocide as the basis of the paper. And I was looking up uh, Hitler. And I used Hitler for the base of all of this. And I came across the writing. And it was a writing that Hitler lived by. And it said the Jews were filth. The Jews were uh, diabolical. The Jews were were in were infectious and a disease and needed to be exterminated. Oh. Believe it or not, it was written by Martin Luther, the guy who brought us Reformation. So this is crazy stuff. When you get back and start studying church history and studying world history, you get kind of blown away. When you see the origin of things and how things start, this one here, again, did you know that Hitler once studied the priesthood? All the guys, the priesthood, all of these guys that 
try to, to, to get rid of the Jews, every last one of them, Mussolini, all of them, had roots in the priesthood. It's crazy. The communists. Roman, Roman Catholic priesthood? Well, Roman Catholic priesthood, yes. Roman Catholic and or uh, there's also a Protestant priesthood. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, I can't tell you if they all was Roman Catholic priesthood, but they all studied the priesthood. Some of them went to Catholic schools. I believe Hitler went to a Catholic school when he was younger. Yeah, All right. yeah he, he was supposed to have been a Jesuit. Yeah, a Jesuit priest. That's right. He was well, right, a Jesuit. And the Jesuit priests back in the day were the Catholic. And here's something else. He was a Jesuit. Thank you for reminding me of that. Jesuit priests were the church's hit men. So you got to remember that too now. Hit men? Hit men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yes. Yeah, so 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 the Catholic Church had hit men. Yeah. So yeah. They're part of the mafia. They're part of the mafia, yeah. So we'll see what we'll see what it was. I know. It's really kinda of wild, isn't it? It kinda of makes you go, Wow. But these guys these guys remember that when the remember during the time of Martin Luther and the Reformation and when they started bringing out the Bible, if you if you were caught with one page from the Bible, they could kill you. You were not allowed to study the Bible on your own. You had to be studied by a priest. The priest had to lead you and guide you. And if the priest did not give you communion, you were not saved. And if you sinned, the only person that could forgive you of your sin was the priest. And so that's some heavy-duty stuff. So he distorted everything to show that it was okay to kill the Jews. And this is, 1 John 3 and 10 says, But this is how we know the children of God, who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do right in the is not a child of God, or anyone that does not love his brother. Okay? That's 1 John 3 10. So let's get back to the paper. Again, it's, this stuff blows me away. You know, the first time I read it, the way I, the first time I read it, I was looking at these little tracks, these little books. Have y'all seen those books? They're about that big, and they got like five, ten pages in them, and they got their cartoons, and they talk about, mm -hmm. and it was talking about all the all the Jesuit priests, and Hitler was one of them, and John Wilkes Booth was one of them. He was studied to be a, a Jesuit priest. He's the one that took out Abraham really? Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth was studying. Really? Yeah, he was studied to be a, a Jesuit priest, yeah. and he took out Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, I'm just telling you. <laughs> Don't they just kind of under the instruction of the Vatican, most likely. Well, yeah. So I'm just telling you, this stuff will blow you away when you. This is very deep. Very. Um, very deep. Good thing I didn't decide to go to be a Catholic. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now is is the Roman Catholic Church is it considered to be a sovereign nation? The Vatican. Yeah. I don't know if it's a sovereign nation. I can't remember. That's that's a good question. I'm trying to remember. Uh, oh. Right here. Yeah, Google Hold it. On. We'll Google it. Yes. Okay, Google. You can tell us in a few minutes on that Google. Yes, see. Is the Vatican. Let's see if it is. the Vatican considered. Its own country. That's the big question I ask all the time. The, here it is. The Vatican City. Y'all listen. Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. It's, in, it's encircled by a two-mile border with Italy. Vatican City is an independent city-state that covers just over 100 acres, making it one-eighth the size of New York Central Park. Vatican City is governed as an absolute monarchy with the Pope at its head. And, and... When all these stuff, when in Italy and Rome and other places were being bombed by Hitler, guess what was not being bombed? The Vatican. That's crazy. Hmm. So, <laughs> That's fascinating stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and, and during that time, um, from my understanding in the catacombs under the Vatican, they had had a I don't know how many Jews it was were in hiding in the catacombs. Yeah. And the Pope, etc., were playing both sides of the card. If Hitler was defeated, we have protected these people. If Hitler had been victorious, here's our final gift to Hitler, the last remaining Jews. 
Crazy stuff. Yeah, you know, I mean, playing both sides of the coin and so I'm, that they could appear to be heroes regardless of who won. Right. Just I'll, like the banks are always, the banks have won every war. Yes, yes. The banks have won every war. There's been there, there's been monasteries. There's over in Rome too. There's a monastery and a nun. I call it a nunnery, but a nunnery yeah. a monastery. And underneath it, in the catacombs, are tombs. Are tombs. There's all. There's all. There, there's babies. There's babies down there because I, I think that the monks and the nuns are going down below. And if one gets pregnant, then they abort the child. I had to either abort the child or the child's born. They take it out. There it is. Yeah, that's a lot of a lot of stuff. I mean, it's some heavy duty stuff. You start studying it, you know, if you do church history, it'll blow you away. When I studied church history, they told me when I first went to Bible college, if you want to backslide, go to Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> and when I started learning all this stuff, I went, oh, I was. I mean, every time I'd come back through, I'd just be, I'd be like, oh no, not another day, not not, not another one. All right, here you go. So, what's your? Here's the second one. What, what's your purpose in life? I'm gonna make it real simple right now. This is this is as elementary as as elementary can be. This is not gonna tell you taking your hands out. You, you know, your dad, you'll be a good dad or a good uncle and a good son and a good father or a good employee, a good church member. Blah blah blah. This is this is just as basic as it can get. Philippians 1:21. To live is Christ. Right it here until I want to see it in this one. To 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 uh, to live is Christ. Paul found all many in life tied to one person. His Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember when he's on the road to Damascus? When he he already excelled, and you got to remember now, Paul said he had the power. He had the power to take a wife, but he didn't. Paul was, was <coughs> in the Sanhedrin, and he was he was rising very quickly above everybody in the Sanhedrin. To be in the Sanhedrin, you had to be over 30 and you had to be married. So when Paul got saved, more than likely when Paul got saved, his wife left him. That's just a thought. But he had to be married. So and he said, I got the power to take a wife. So that means that she, she has left him and just cut all cords. I got the power to take a wife. But he doesn't. So well, she may have died. She may have died. Yeah, she could have. Uh, nobody knows. That's one of those things that's not told. Uh, but but when he's on the road to Damascus, it, it, he said, Who art thou? And knocked me down. He said, I am Jesus Christ, the one thou persecutest. So he realized at that moment he wasn't just hurting, he wasn't just touching the church. Whenever he touched the church, he was actually touching Jesus and hurting him. It's like when we hurt each other, that's why we got to know we're not fighting. We're not fighting each other. Because when we hurt each other, we're hurting Jesus. Wow, that's heavy. If I hurt Eddie, especially maliciously, which I won't, what I'm saying is if I was to hurt Eddie maliciously, I'm not just hurting Eddie, I'm hurting Jesus. Because he's the apple of Jesus' eye. And if I touch Eddie, I'm sticking my finger in Jesus' eye. Jesus doesn't like ugly. He don't like ugly. No. So, so, again, he says here, tied to one person, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all his striving, all his struggling, serving was for the glory of another. He self-sacrificed, he was crucified for the cause of Christ. And when I say crucified, I'm not talking about, but Paul lost his head because he was a Roman citizen. The Roman citizens were not crucified. They, they were beheaded. But he crucified himself daily for Christ. So, uh, to live is Christ. Wow, that's, that's just, it says here, uh, uh, for me to live, for me to live is Christ. And that word live is actually to breathe. To breathe, every blessing I get is to be blessed, to, to, to be living, to enjoy the real life. Everything I enjoy, everything I'm going to, everything, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, or wonderful, I do it for do it as, or uh, to Christ. And when I die, when I finally lose this natural life, I'm going to find this word gain, because it's not just gain, it is great gain. 
Matter of fact, it's gain that cannot be counted. Wow. When we die and go to heaven, the gain we get in heaven cannot be counted down here on earth. Wow. I mean, I think about Trump and think about Rockefeller. You know, Rockefeller should be the richest man in the world. When he died, somebody said, how much did he leave? And somebody else said, everything. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> so, so here we go. To live as Christ, but to die. So, so first, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Paul knew that at the end of this temporal, physical life meant the beginning of an eternal, eternity of living in the presence of Jesus. Do you know, <clears throat> and I tell this to people all the time, because people ask when they go, to, when somebody's dying, whether it be um, at the prison or at the hospital as a chaplain or as a pastor, they ask them what happened to their loved one that just died. And I, I always can calmly and assuredly assure them that their loved one never lost consciousness. When you die, you never lose consciousness. When you die, you step over to the other side. Never thought of it that way. That's awesome. Hmm. Your body, your body ceases. Your body, your eyes may close. <clears throat> I can't tell you, and I'm not trying this as a, any kind of bragging because it's not a brag at all. Because <clears throat> sometimes <clears throat> it makes you, it keeps me up at night sometimes thinking about it. The people that have died and have closed their eyes in death and helped get their, get their arms straight and their hands straight, uh, uh, or help take them out with the with the uh, with the undertaker, or at hospitals especially when a loved one dies, you know. <clears throat> and the ones that even died in my arms, I think about it. But you know, they may cease to exist here, but what's so powerful is they never lost consciousness. But how would you how would you know that? Because the Bible says to be absent from the body. <coughs> Is to be present with the Lord. Okay. It's like this. Watch this. Watch. Watch. Watch this. Here's life. And here's death. Alright? I see. Watch this. I see my very yeah, first. My very happens. first exhale. My very first exhale. A verse hair. Or my last exhale. Of eternity. Isn't that cool? I mean, look, 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 it's just, that's so awesome. Okay, okay, I'll do it again, look, look. The last, you, when, when you exhale earth's air, you inhale eternity. My mama didn't have any legs, her heart was messed up, and, and, and her eyes were gone, her kidneys were gone, and she was laying in that bed, and there she was, and she couldn't move on her own, and when she finally went, I can see her now. My mama loved to dance. I can see her dancing, dancing, dancing. Isn't that cool? Because it's just a step over. Isn't that cool? So, so we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of death at all. Well, I don't want to be afraid of death because I'm just, look, look. What's there to be afraid of? Look. Because not only do you do that, but watch this. Come here, Eddie. Look, here's Eddie the angel. Watch. Why, look, you stare, you're in heaven. While I'm waiting to die, Eddie comes to my presence. Come on. All right. And he takes me over here. Takes me. <laughs> <laughs> he escorts me into God's presence. So. Now he pulls you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the angel got to yank me, I'm pretty sure. Okay. <laughs> and I want to know what's going to go on behind me. Okay. So. Next time, don't ask anybody. So, why do we have to be afraid of death? We don't. It's awesome to think about that part. All right. So to die is, and remember, to die is gain, meaning it cannot even be calculated how great a gain we're going to be receiving. Wow. So, so here we go. To die is gain. All right, here's Paul knew that even after his death, his purpose in life would continue on so powerful. Remember me telling you that that. That you do not. Everybody says when <clears throat> somebody dies, now they're getting their now they're getting their reward. No, they're not. They're getting eternal life, and they're getting they're in the presence of God. But it's not their reward. <clears throat> you don't get your reward till the seven years of tribulation, 
at the marriage supper of the Lamb, there's the beam of judgment seat of Christ. That's where you get rewarded because if I die tonight, and let's just say it took a thousand years before Jesus Christ come back, my influence would go on for that thousand years. Y'all's influence goes on. Everybody's influence goes on. I hear Eddie all the time talking about his granddaddy or talking about his daddy or his mama. I talk about my mama. I sit there and I'm thinking, why well, not my mama used to tell me this or my granddaddy used to do this, you know, uh, <clears throat> and and today I was sitting there talking to Linda at breakfast, and all of a sudden I thought about something that both my granddads from both sides of the family, that both of them had in common, and, and it just I never even thought of it until today ever. And I thought of it today, and I said it, and I said, wow. You know, but again, their influence is still Brother Hastum's influence. I never step in that pulpit without thinking about Brother Hastum. <laughs> okay? So so it's just it's just that way. And so, again, their influence. And I remember when I went to see Brother Hastum, the uh, one of the last times, not the last time, but I got a call that he was in Martin General in intensive care. He didn't know anybody. And they said, they thought this might be the end. So I said, well, I'll be right there. And it was like uh, 9 or 10 o'clock at night. I drove up there and got into intensive care. <clears throat> and I walked in, when I walked in, he was, remember now, he didn't know anybody. I walked in, he's sitting over there, or laying over there, and he opened his eyes. I said, you're looking good. <laughs> He, yeah, my brother, he said, he said, Brother David, how are you doing, my brother? Come over here. <laughs> so, so I walked over to him, and, 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 and I hugged him, and I said, you know what? You're beautiful. I never told a man he was beautiful before, but I told him that, and I, yeah. you're beautiful. I can see the glow of God on special. him. And I said, you're so special. You've taught me so much. I can never thank you for all the things you've taught me. And he said, mm -hmm. he said, you've been like a son to me. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh it was just awesome. We got a chance to talk for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, but I knew I needed to let him rest. And and then when he was at the house and wouldn't eat, and they couldn't get him to eat, I'd come around, they'd call me, and I'd always get him to eat. If he wouldn't eat, I'd give him a milkshake, get him to drink, drink, drink a milkshake. But but I can I, mean, I remember thinking about that thing, you know, all the influence that man's had on me. And, and there's been some bad influences, too. <laughs> Have y'all ever had any bad influences? No. It teaches you how not to be? Okay. Well, still, all those people, my granddaddies have been dead for a long, long time, but they're more than me. Mm -hmm. Think about it. There's people in your life that's been dead for a long time, but they're still alive in you because their influence, that's how it does. Their influence lives on in you, and you've passed it down to somebody else, and then they've passed it down. You know, I sit there and watch Bethany sometimes, how she does things. And I'm thinking, would you please come on and quit talking to everybody? And this somebody says, she's just like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, again, <laughs> so, so, again, remember, when you die, you get, you get eternal life, you've already got eternal life, we just step into it, into eternity, if our, the day you accept Jesus Christ, you've got eternal life, but you step into eternity when you take that last breath of earth's air and breathe that first breath of heaven's air, you step into eternity, you see now, you were living by faith, now you're living by sight, but you still don't get your final reward until the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's because your influence lives on way after you do. So now, now uh, I, it tickles me when I hear D.C. and Daniel's wives call him, both of them, David Jr. How you call him Daniel, David Jr.? Say, when I see him, I see you. When I see him doing something, he's doing something. And I go, well, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Now, now Hitler, Hitler found all meaning in his life tied to and wrapped in one person, and it wasn't Jesus. Remember, Paul's life was tied up and wrapped up in one person, Jesus. But Hitler's life was all tied up and wrapped up in himself. Okay? It was all about Satan. Hitler. Oh, that's right. It's all about himself. He all was about, all about himself up there. In that's place. right. All about all about himself. All about all about him. So, so. He said, I shall become the greatest man in history. This is what he said. This isn't my sayings. We didn't make this up. This is what he said. I shall become the greatest man in history. And he has become one of the most infamous men in history. Okay? Because I mean, you think about it. You think he just killed Jews? He didn't just kill Jews. He killed his own people. 
He killed a, a million and a half Jews, but he also killed over 70,000 of his own people. He killed people that were, were mentally ill. He killed people that were his soldiers to come back and were, were going to have to take a, a, a lifetime of care. He killed them. Uh, one thing he did right, because the first group of people he, he killed was the lawyers and politicians. What? I thought you were going to say because he died. No, he, the first group of people he killed was the lawyers and politicians. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then, here we go. He had to get rid of them so he could carry on. <laughs> He said this, listen, I have to gain more immortality even if the whole German nation perishes in the process. Wow. Hitler's words of self-importance stand in contrast to God's word. If any man thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Galatians chapter 6 verse 3. This is, this is a, a, a study that I wish everybody in the church could hear. And I wish they could hear some of these statistics that we all are hearing right now because it blew me away. It keeps blowing me away to think about things like this and how Hitler thought he was under divine mandate by God. You know, it's just crazy. So, we're going we're gonna to read this bottom part and talk about it. you got any questions you can ask. And then we're going to gonna end tonight. But your purpose in life is an expression of your personal significance to God. Now, what does significance mean? In detail. Break it up. Okay. Break it down. All right. All right. Your life is an expression of what God has called you to do. You know, you think about, well, why am I, why am I always, why, look, it's like this. Why do, have you ever said, why do I always wind up? I don't want that was. <laughs> Why, why, have you ever said, why does it always seem to wind up working in a place where I've got to do black, 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 black? Why is it when I go somewhere, it seems like I always get caught up with somebody that's black, 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 black? Why is it whatever I seem to be doing, I always get caught up in this crowd of people, or I'm always being asked this question, you know why it's always happening to you? It's because the expression of God's significance in your life. Significance. Think about signing. God signed his autograph on you. You you he signed you. He authorized you. You're not you you are one of a kind. And 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 I think about, you know, I've only worked a couple places in my life, you know, uh that was actually before I before I went to college, I, I worked at Roses and I worked at some grocery stores with Daddy. Then I worked at Procter and Gamble. And I, I pulled a little stint at, at uh, National Spending, but then I worked at Fountain Power Boats. And so that was the three places that I worked. And, and I always wound up working engineering, and I always wound up uh, troubleshooting things, but I also wound up getting surrounded by people who needed help. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. If y'all can know how many people got saved in those boats, the Fountain Power Boats. I mean, got saved right there in the boat. They called me, called me, and said, "Man, I'm about, I'm about, to, about to blow up. You got to help me." And even Mr. Fountain said, "Can you please go help him?" Or, or the COO, or some of the supervisors said, "Please take this person out and talk to him." And it was amazing. But right there in the boats, or our vice presidents go in the room and shut the door and pray with them. And it's just, just, I mean, each place kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, uh, again, I, so I, I knew even as a small child. Uh, the pastor was there. You know what I'm saying? So y'all know. Y'all got things in you that you've been doing since y'all were little. And you keep wondering, why do we keep doing this? God has a specific assignment for each of us. And if you will ask God, God, have you ever said, God, guide me and direct me and lead me? And then you wonder, why do I keep getting all this mess? <laughs> then you ask God to guide you, lead you, and direct you? Were you expecting an angel to come down and say, <laughs> to pick you up and float you. <laughs> you know, no. It's more like a guy that a missile hit you. Bam! Okay. So, so yeah, go ahead. here we go. Here goes another Bible study. I can hear it now. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Beth. When I always think about that, I'm always thinking about, like, Garmin. 
like 500 feet turn left or right. I'm always <coughs> waiting for someone to point to the direction. And uh, I'm used to the one. <laughs> no, you just threw me. <laughs> Bam! Bam! <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Beth is. I don't know. I don't got. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. It's like when I fell out of the airplane when I was doing that jump. I thought he was going to give me a little bit of a warning. He did. He just said, "Slide your legs out." And we're going 150 miles an hour, so my legs are. It's not. I'm not shaking. The, the wind's got my legs, and I'm trying to get my legs out on that little bit of ramp. And and the wind's got them doing like this. And I'm thinking, wow, this is this is awesome and weird and wild at the same time. And before I knew it, I told myself, when I go out, I said, here's all I want to do. Don't just go out like this. I said, I want to flip. That's what I told him. I want to flip, right? And so we're going out. And he said, just slide slowly, slide slowly. And so I'm sliding slowly. And all of a sudden, Toof. and I'm going, whoo. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, again, again, so, so your purpose in life, you say, well, God never uses me. Really? How many people have you talked to lately that needed, that you've told them that God has the answer? How many people have you helped lately, even if you just walked up and, uh, all right, like that, all right, let me tell you this. And I'm not paying any medals on me at all. None. Because I knew this was a God thing. I, I was, I was, uh, Working on a piece of equipment, working on a fan in my house, exhaust fan, Saturday. And I thought Lowe's, according to Google, Lowe's had it. I get to Lowe's, they ain't got it. So the lady is helping me. And she winds up, she's a Christian, and, and we went up talking about God. It's really awesome. Well, as I'm walking out, she said, well, these measurements are the same. I said, okay, I'll try that one then. The measurements weren't the same. They were really off by a couple of inches. And when you're working in a little bitty hole, a couple of inches is a lot. Okay? I'd have to go cut the sheetrock out and reposition the, the exhaust fan. Uh, so but I went up there, and so I went and carried it back. And when I carried it back, they gave me the money, and I stuck it in my front pocket. It was $50. I flew up stuck in my front pocket. And I started to put it in my wallet, and I heard the spirit say, no. Leave it in that front pocket. Okay. So I just left front pocket. A day later, that was on Saturday. I had it in my pocket here Sunday when I was preaching. Had it in my front <laughs> pocket. Monday I go to the store. And I happened to walk into a guy, and the guy said, uh, I said, how are you doing? And this guy had been a very big influence on my life. And this guy says, well, and he's in his up in his age. He's got some age on now, probably close to late 70s. And he goes, well, and he was a well-off man at one time. He said, well, I know what it's like to have been well-off, and I know what it's like to kind of scrape to get by. And he said, uh, I know both ways. And I said, yeah. He said, I like being well-off better. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, but right now I'm in the scraping. And I said, but that's when God gets a chance to show his power. And the Lord speaks to me and says, remember that $50? Mm -hmm. I stuck my hand in my pocket, and I was talking to him. He was getting groceries. He said, Sometimes you wonder where groceries are going to come from. And I said, you know what? God's got a way of blessing you. You won't even, can't even imagine. He says, I know that. I've been serving a long time. He always comes through. I said, yeah, don't he? I said, but I'm in a hurry. If you don't mind, i got to go. He said, all right. I said, I put up my hand like I was going to shake his hand. And he felt that cash. And I said, <laughs> and I kept on walking. And so that was so awesome. You know what I'm saying? That God had talked to me, and I had that in my pocket versus in my wallet. I mean, the whole thing was just awesome. So guess what? That was one of God's purposes in my life. Okay? Did I preach to him? Well, I preached to him because but I'm talking about, though, uh, I walked through Walmart one day, and the guy said, man, can you help me? I'm, I, I ain't had anything to eat, and I don't know how long. Can you give me a few dollars? I said, no, can't give you a few dollars. I said, but if you'll come with me, I'll take care of you. And I took him back to the deli. I said, get whatever you want. He said, whatever I want. I said, well, don't get four chickens. I mean, get a meal. <laughs> And so he got his meal, and I carried him out, and I paid for it. But the other night, I told Linda, I come in the house. She says, you look like you've seen a ghost. And I said, I, I think I just saw an angel. And she said, how would you see an angel? I said, well, I forgot to put, Bethany was telling me, don't forget gas in your car. Remember that? Don't forget gas in your car. Well, I forgot gas in my car. 
And so I'm riding along, I'm looking down, I said, oh no. So I pull over to the gas station. And while I'm getting gas, it's so cold, while I'm getting gas, all of a sudden this old man comes up, an old man, his shoes, I don't know where these shoes came from, they don't even look like they're from Earth. And he's standing there, and he's just looking at me, right beside me, while I'm pumping my gas. And I said, can I help you, sir? And he said, I'm hungry. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let me finish pumping my gas. We'll go inside the store, and whatever you want, we'll get it. He said, never talk to you. He said, and so when I got to pump my gas, he was standing at the door. He would not even go in the door of the store. He sat over to the side. And I opened up the door, and I said, hey, man, hey, buddy, come on. And he looked at me and said, I said, yeah, you, come on. He never spoke again. I walked inside the store, and I said, uh, Get you something, then you grab the honey one. I said, no, get you something hot. And so, and so I, I showed him where the hamburgers were. They got a hamburger. I said, get whatever you want. So he picked out a hamburger. And I put it in the, I asked the guy how much, how much time on the microwave. He told me, second in the microwave. And I said, well, don't just get that. Get you some drink, a drink and some chips. And so he goes and gets the 25 cent chips and gets a small drink. Doesn't say anything. But the look on his face just, oh, it just, and, and so after I gave it to him, after I gave it to him, I said, do you have a good night now? And he said, thank you. And I'm not saying he vanished. I just never saw him again. And I got home and I told Linda, I said, I think I just entertained an angel unaware. Mm -hmm. It was powerful. And just think about it now, it gives me chills. You know, go ahead, Bethany. My favorite story of yours is when you're in uh, Krispy Kreme. And the woman. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, me and Brandon were in Krispy Kreme. We were done two going to the ministry that night, the prison ministry. We come walking out, and a lady comes running up. She's got all three, all three of the cans. She's like this. And she walks, she runs up out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. She's just right in front of us. And she says, Mr., can, can, you got any money I can have? And I said, I, she says, all I need is $7.48. And I said, $7.48? She says, yeah, because I've got a prescription over at Walgreens. All I need is $7.48. I need something for my hands. And Brandon says, I don't have any money. All I got is a card. And I reached in and Brandon said, you watch that, dude. I had $7.48. <laughs> exactly. And so I handed it to her. And she thanked She said, I don't want to do this. She said, but, and then she said, I'll pray for y'all. Y'all pray for me. And we prayed for her. And then there she went walking off, and there it was. You know, but I think that was another angel. That we was saw an earthly, Barbara and I saw an earthly angel today. We stopped at the gas <coughs> station to get gas. Going to Greenville to get her medicine prescriptions mm -hmm. to take with her down there. And we couldn't, she got out, she put gas in the car. She couldn't get the cap in. I couldn't get the cap in, and there was nobody at the other side of the tank. And all of a sudden this woman pulls up, and we didn't see the guy. We didn't see the guy in that car. But all of a sudden, she had to turn the car around because she pulled in the wrong way. And he gets out of the vehicle. When she pulled up there, we didn't see him. And so he got out of the car to go in and turn the money in because you couldn't use your car on that side. And I said, young man, would you mind helping us? And he said, sure. He said, what is it? And we fixed. He, neither one of us could get that cap to tighten me in there and he come in there and he tightened that cap right in and got, got us going and he went on in the store and I told him I said God bless you because <laughs> we didn't know you know the what the gas would have come flying around yeah yeah and we didn't know what to do we were looking around trying to find somebody and all of a sudden he just appeared it's like it's like set there. I mean it's we awesome he man. The, the woman in that vehicle God does that. God does that. It's like Saturday when I was trying to change the tire on my daughter-in-law's car. I knew the jack was a little crooked, but I didn't know it was falling over. And my friend who lives 30 miles away was coming through to see something for his daughter and saw me on the side of the road and pulls up and says, Dude, that car's getting ready to fall. And I was underneath it. Uh -huh. And so he comes along and has the right kind of jack and everything. And he pops right up and we take care of it. It's just, yeah, God's awesome. But look, your purpose in life is an expression of your personal... Everybody's put together with a purpose. You notice that, that when they build ships, they build ships, they build destroyers, they build aircraft carriers. The aircraft carrier is designed to, an uh, aircraft carrier is a little city. 
It is an absolute city. And it's designed not only to, to, to uh, land, land planes and to launch planes and helicopters, but it can take care of them. I mean, it's like an airport. It's a little city. It's right there. Then you got, then you got little tugboats. They're made for pulling the boats. And then you got uh, uh, destroyers, and you got uh, 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 all kinds of stuff. You got bomber planes, and then you got fighter jets. Everything is designed for a certain purpose. Do you know that some of us are bomber planes? Some of us are fighter jets. Some of us, we all got different purposes. And sometimes we get, you know, I would, I'd rather be a bomber. And God says, No, you're a fighter jet. Or I'm a, I'd rather be a fighter jet. Well, no, you're a bomber. Okay, whatever. But, you know, we wouldn't argue with God because we're not what we want to be. And God says, I know what I need you to be because I've already given it to you. I give everything in you that you needed for this. Watch this. Yeah. I, I, th I think you're a, um, uh, a battleship. You used to be an aircraft carrier until you lost weight. <laughs> I was talking about all of us in general, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Look, look. <laughs> that was fun. Look, it'll be unique. Yeah, I can't listen to that one. I will. Be laugh out I will. <laughs> it will be unique to you based on God's personalized plan <clears throat> for you. When I went to Fountain Power Boats, I was very, I was distressed. I was aggravated. <clears throat> Uh, because I remember going to my office, and the office is about half the size of this room, and books are everywhere. Now all things are on your computer, but back then it was books. And I walked in and saw those books, and I said, I'm supposed to be a pastor, and I'm working at Fountain Power Boats. Because Beverly got sick, and then Beverly died. But I didn't realize that when I went to Fountain, not only was it going to help me get put me up to speed on a lot of modern technology, which was awesome, but also I was there to talk to people I would never talk to. What's the chances? What is the absolute chance of me talking to Tony Robbins? Mm -hmm. Who's that? People know who Tony Robbins is, the, the self-help guru. Oh, the Look dude at, off of the show. Gorilla, yeah, Gorilla Hands. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, uh, who was the one that ran for president? The old man ran for president from Texas. Uh, the, he's the one they... Ross Perot. Yeah. What's the chances of me talking to Ross Perot? Mm. No. Uh, you, you, know, you know, they they had a new hybrid corn named after him. Uh-oh. Here we go. Doesn't get very tall, but it's got big ears. <laughs> <laughs> this is on. This is on camera. All right, so here we go. Look, think about your own life. I wasn't just saying it for me. I'm talking about your own life. Think about things that you do that you wouldn't normally do if God hadn't put you in that position. You know what I'm saying? God put you in that position for a purpose. All right? It's unique to you based on God's personalized plan for you. It's that which gives you a reason for living and set forth by God who put you here on earth. Everybody here has got a reason for living. There's not a person here that does not have a calling. There's not a purpose here that has not made a difference in somebody's life. You think about on Sunday mornings that I know I'm ministering to y'all. you got to remember something. Y'all are ministering to me too. It's a double thing. If somebody's called to ministry, they're, ministry, they're, they're ministered back to when they're ministering to others. <laughs> think about it. When you, when, you, when you help somebody else, your biggest, your biggest uh, boost to you is to help them, isn't it? When I was at EMT, I mean, to save a life was just, oh, man, it was just, it was amazing. You know, it made you feel small, but also it made you feel glad that you trained, you know. And I remember the time that I was cutting grass. I hadn't worked with the World Rescue Squad in a couple of years. And I was out cutting grass, and, and my uncle come running. He lived right next door to me. He come running out while I was cutting the grass. I said, what's going on? And, and uh, he said, my father-in-law just died. Whoa. And so I run over to the house, and his father-in-law was sitting there, but his father-in-law weighed about 300, excuse me, about 400 pounds. And and he was like this, and he wasn't breathing. And I knew what to do. So I went on ahead, and I checked him. I said, put him on the floor. Put him on the floor. He's having a he's in some kind of diabetic distress. Put him on the floor. So we picked him up, put him on the floor, and I went ahead and, and I saw that he had a pulse, and I established an airway. I made I made a, 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 a tongue, I took a, took a spoon and used it, and I, I opened his mouth, and I got him breathing again. And so he was fine until the rescue squad got there. But if I hadn't been in that space at that, at that time with that kind of training, he'd have died. Because mm. his airway was cut off. And he weren't breathing. 
And the man lived for years, years, years after that. But again, you know, so God does things like He push you, he, he, he push you in certain places at certain times. You don't even realize what, you know, this is something that God's called you to do. So the New Testament word for purpose is prothesis, or a setting forth. And when referring to the purposes, and when referring to purposes of God, it means a deliberate intention that God sets you forth. Do you think we're here tonight by accident? Do you think you're hearing this by accident? Do you think that we're starting this over again by accident? No. Not at all. Because when I when I started to go, so when I started to get back in this, the Lord distinctly spoke to me as hard as I could hear it and said, Don't start there, back up. Well, there's Don. Don, you kind of worried when I first saw that, that chair come back here. Well, I wasn't expecting to see Don wheeling and dealing back there. So, again. God intentionally sets us forth. We didn't just happenstance be a member of every Christian church. Okay, God's got something for us here, for us to do. When you think about that, when you're having these moments when you're discouraged, and when you think you're not making a difference, then you realize, yes, you are. You're making a big difference. Just, just, just keep on keeping on. So in Him, we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Ephesians 1.11 Everybody's got a purpose. Everybody. I can tell you every last one of you in here have made a difference in my life. Every last one of you. There's not a person in here that hasn't made a difference in my life. I'm telling you. You might not think you're, you might not think you're doing a whole lot. Yes, you are. You're doing a whole lot. Because not even made a difference in my life. I'm pretty sure that everybody in here if you could, if you could pick out any one person in here, you've made a difference in everybody's life in this room. Mm -hmm. I can think of, I can sit here and think of things that everybody's made an impression in my life. Yeah, that's changes. right. It is. It's amazing. You know, you don't think about it. It just, it, see, we think it's got to be some kind of great thing behind the pulpit. It's not a great thing behind the pulpit. It is. You know, when I first started preaching, I thought about pulpit, 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 pulpit. And Brother Hayseth told me, said, Brother David, <laughs> he said, he said, the pulpit is just a small portion of what you're going to do. I said, really, Brother Hayseth? He said, yes. He said, you've got 30 minutes or more. Remember, or more. <laughs> On Sunday morning to make a difference. He said, but it's during the week when you go to those people's houses. And I said, Wow. When you go to the hospitals, when you go to the prisons, that's when you make your big difference. I said, okay, Brother Hayseth, cool. And I remember him, when I first went to every, every Christian, when I first went to the Greenville Church of God for the intern, and he said, uh, he said, so you work at Procter & Gamble? I said, yes, I do. And he says, what do you do? I said, I do electrical and instrumentation, and I do computers, and I do project engineering. He said, good, we need that here. <laughs> He made sure it was used every chance he got. <laughs> and and then he said, he go and they said, Brother David, come over here after you get off work. I said, all right. He said, bring some old clothes. I said, we're going to minister. He says, yes. I said, where? He said, in Robertsonville. I said, okay, cool. We're going to minister in Robertsonville. I got there. He said, bring your meter. Old he said, bring your old clothes and your meter, and bring your bring your electrical tools. <laughs> So I walked in and he said, we're going to minister to my mother today. I said, we are? I said, that's awesome. You're going to minister to your mother? That's amazing. Yeah, that's cool. He got in the house and said, see that ceiling fan over there? I said, yeah. He says, we want it over here. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's a ministry. Yeah, that's right. He was awesome. He was so, so awesome. So, again... That was ministry. So think about the things you've done to help people that you didn't even realize what you were doing. So, so remember, God's called us. And it doesn't always have to have a Bible in your hand and thumping somebody over the head. You know, DC tickled me Sunday. He said, Dad, I don't know why you're having a hard time getting the riff for this song. He said, because you've heard, you've played this song 
a hundred times. I said, well, DC, sometimes I preach the same, the same scripture a thousand times and people still don't get it. <laughs> and he said, okay, I walked off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Good That's right. Any questions? Any any anything? You didn't read the last line. What's the last line? This Ephesians. I thought I did. In him we were chosen, having predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything with conformity with the purpose of his will. Any more questions? Any more answers? Any more jokes? <laughs> Any more stories? Any more stories? I got a million stories. That's not good. Like last night. Look, last night they said it was going to snow. It was raining. So I told Linda, I said, well, you know what? I, uh, I said our water, our water filter was our water filter was was clogging up. I said, well, we need to change this water filter. I said, I'm just going to make a real quick trip to Walmart. She said, okay. So I get in the car and it's raining. <laughs> When I get around the corner, I see a couple of snowflakes. So I called her and said, honey, I think it may be snowing. I'm not sure. And by the time I got to the hospital, I saw more snowflakes. By the time I got to the mall, it was snow everywhere. So I called her and said, it's snow. And by the time I got to Walmart, I was going to run in and run out. But as soon as I walked into Walmart and run back to where the water fields were, here come another minister. And I said, hey, buddy, I got to go. And he said, here it goes. Can I ask you a question? And I'll leave it at that. But can I ask you a question? And 30 minutes later, I go out to my car. And it's not yet. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, again, you never know. Just going to get that water filter. What's the odds of another minister coming, coming to the water filters where I'm at at that time? Yeah. So, question? Linda's probably got used to you going out to be just gone a little bit. <laughs> oh, she's used to that. She, she's used to that, yeah. She has to be. She told me she's one time, someone put a bag over your head when you go into Walmart. <laughs> the unknown comment. <laughs> yeah, the unknown comment. Anybody got any more questions, any answers, any? No. All right. Let's look. Isn't this cool? Boy, that's good. Mm -hmm. Very. Yeah, yeah. Very right. informative. Yes. Especially right. when y'all got into Hitler. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And hit me. <laughs> what, 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 the, the, the Catholic Church was very, they had a counter-reformation. I'm going to have to read up on that. Yeah, read, that, yeah, read up on the counter-reformation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, if you, they did not want you, they did not want you learning on your own. And that's why everything was in everything was in, in, in Latin and all this stuff. They didn't want you learning it. That's not for the common man. The Bible was not for the common man in their eyes. And that's why all these priests had had masters and doctors degrees because they knew all that Latin and Latin and uh, Greek and Hebrew. All right, let's pray. The Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for all you do for us. I thank you, God, that we're not alone. We're not walking by ourselves. We've got you every step of the way. Minister to us and through us, Father. Make a difference in our lives, Lord. And help us understand that all of us, no matter who we are, all of us have a divine purpose. It doesn't have to have a Bible in it. It doesn't have to have a pulpit in it. It doesn't even have to have the church in it. Every day, whatever we do, if it's just opening up a door for somebody that their hands are full or, or reaching out and helping somebody, it is part of God's plan for us to make a difference in somebody's life. Help us understand that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks for the history lesson.